Okay, hello everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, so my talk is about systematic learning and I'll explain as we go. You, you need to use the clicker. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so I'll explain as I go what I mean by that. Um, but I'm gonna start uh, by introducing, um, by, by talking a little bit about large language models since we are neurosymbolic in the age of large language models. Um, so, you know, in the last year, there's been so many papers uh, out that have started to really look with a gimlet eye at, at what um, large language models are doing. And if you sort of net it out, it's a pretty mixed bag. Uh, I think for the most part, there's very little compositional generalization with some exceptions. There's not much abstraction. In many ways, um, it, it, as other people have pointed out, it, it's they are they are very unsystematic in, in the ways that we expect them to be. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a few of those failures. I think they're probably familiar to everyone, and other people have used examples as well. But but just to set up my the rest of my talk, I'm going to talk about some of the failures, um, some desiderata for what I'm terming here systematic learning. Uh, uh, and then I'm going to introduce this particular architecture, this particular model that we've built called CPG that exhibits some of the properties in a limited way that, that we've been talking about, the compositionality, abstraction, token type distinction, program generation, and other things. Um, I'll show you some experiments that we ran, um, and then I'll... Okay, so... Um, Arguably, one way to sort of characterize what's going on with large language models is that there, there's a failure of systematicity. So uh, similar inputs give you different answers, different responses, I should say. They're very sensitive to rephrasings and reorderings. There was a, a paper recently pointing out that the, the premise order for logical reasoning is important. So if you switch the, we, want, we all know the, the set of premises is a set, shouldn't matter, but it matters to them. Um, so, you know, it, it's it's a way of, it, that's an example of similar things that are being treated differently. Um, dissimilar inputs can yield the same response. Um, and they sort of importantly, and, and something that isn't sort of brought up as much, um, well, I guess it is, but they don't have any consistent compositional ability. And often this is characterized as they don't reuse solutions. And that's true, probably. They don't, they don't figure out task B and then use it to do better on task A. Um, but even aside from that sort of efficiency issue, there's just, even if they were to just redo task B as part of some task A, you often get a result from task A that's inconsistent with what, with what happens if you do B alone. So what you'd really like is that independently, if you do task B and you get some answer, whatever happens, B is necessary to solve A, you'd like it, you'd like the output that you get from task A to be consistent, and it's often not. So in all these ways, I think large language models are not systematic and cause misalignment with, with we're not entirely systematic, obviously, as people, but when there is something, a domain which is systematic, we expect it from the model to get it. Okay, so here's some concrete examples. This I've taken from Berland et al. Um, in this case, if you if um, you query ChatGPT, you, you you ask who is Tom Cruise's mother, it gets the answer right. So somehow in there, it knows the fact that um, Mary Lee Pfeiffer is the mother of Tom Cruise, but yet the equivalent fact that Tom Cruise is the son of Mary Lee Pfeiffer. Um, doesn't get employed in the same way and you get a different answer. So similar things, um, different answers. Conversely, uh, you give it very, maybe maybe superficially similar things, but really quite different semantically. And sometimes you get the right, you, you get the same answer. So I don't know, does everybody know the Monty Hall problem? Okay, so you give it the Monty, of course, the Monty Hall problem is, is everywhere. It knows the Monty Hall problem. It regurgitates the right solution. But you give it a, um, <clears throat> a slight variation on the Monty Hall problem where, and I'm, I've, I've cribbed this from, from uh, Francois Cholet's talk, but this particular example. Um, if you give it a, the sort of not Monty Hall problem, which is you pick a door, Monty opens the door to reveal the car, 
it still gives you the Monty Hall problem. Clearly, in that case, you don't want to switch doors. You've got the car. So it's not, it's not it's just not semantically valid. It's not really parsing this stuff and, and doing the right thing. Um, and, and for composition, um, it's a little bit of a mixed bag, but mostly it's inconsistently, uh, it, it generalizes inconsistently um, in compositional problems. So this is an example from uh, Faith, Faith and Faith by Ziri et al. Um, they just gave it the task of uh, doing long, long multiplication like you learn in grade school, where you multiply each digit one at a time. And they've helpfully, in this case, broken it down um, in a in a uh, a context um, prompt to help it understand what the algorithm is. So it's not just throwing it out there. Um, and so they there's there's problem A, which is the first multiplication and how you do that, second multiplication and how you do that, and then you have to combine the solutions to these two things. And even with this sort of template for prompting, um, this template for the algorithm. You see, um, you see that it doesn't really generalize well. And the results of it, if you look at the paper, you can see that. So these three things, I think, together constitute uh, a, a kind of, you know, you can sum this up as saying a, a failure of systematicity, a failure to treat similar things similarly. So what, what is it actually that we want? And, and I'll put it out there that what we want are low complexity algorithms. And I mean low complexity in the Kolmogorov complexity sense that they're simple programs. Um, we want we want models that treat similar things similarly, and also that treat different things differently. So um, you know neural nets treat similar things similarly. They just think everything is similar, so it doesn't it doesn't really matter. Um, they don't they don't distinguish between classes, um, and that that can be crippling. I'll show an example of how that how that doesn't. Um, or I'll, I'll discuss it a little bit anyway. Um, so they treat similar things diff similarly. They treat different things differently. Similar is obviously something that's task dependent. So it's not something that we can predefine, but we, but with respect to a task, we seem to understand what the important class, semantic classes are, and we respect them and we expect the models to do the same. Um, for me, similarly means using the same abstract program. That's what's going to get you compositional generalization and out of domain generalization. Um, and that's what we've done. Um, and they don't learn and predict compositionally. So we would like systematic models to learn and predict compositionally. And I say learn and predict because um, you know you see you see tests of, of, of compositionality in models, they train them to the end, they test them to see if they can generalize to some compositions of things that they've seen in training, and they report the results. But actually, if you really are a compositional learner, you should be composition. You should be using that composition during learning. It's not. It's not like you learn and then you do something else. We do it all the time, and I think Ben was sort of point, pointing that out in his talk that this is an iterative, continual process. So one one could suspect that that such models would use much less data because if you are during learning, you're able to combine solutions for things that you've already learned. You don't need data. You might need data for the combining part, but you don't need data um, to for the for the new thing in its entirety, which includes the, the little pieces that you want to combine. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a hypothesis is that 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 um, compositional learning should really um, help you learn few shot. Okay, so to kind of um, compare yeah. neural nets and just just hit the hit the point home. Neural nets versus systematic models. Um, neural nets are programs which are relatively simple structurally. So they don't have a lot of loops. They don't have um, conditionals. Uh, they, they, they're, I'm, I'm thinking now of, of feed forward networks. Clearly with recurrent networks, you do have a loop, but it's still, they're pretty simple structurally. Um, the, the computation is static. So you don't get different programs for different inputs. Neural net is just the program that you get for all inputs. Um, and because of this, there's a certain lack of flexibility that when the task increases, you get big fat tensors and that's what we have now. So anytime you wanna scale up a neural network, there's nowhere to go. There's no code to change. The only thing you can do is make the part of the program that's called the weights bigger to give it more capacity. Um, and they're not simple. 
um, in terms of algorithmic complexity, because even though the code part, the part that you write is pretty simple, the weight part is billions of real numbers that are largely incompressible. And that's part of the program. So I, I, to me, this is the distinction and this sort of graphic here is illustrating a little tiny program for the neural net with a big fat tensor attached to it um, versus a systematic model which shows that which might have more structure to it, um, modularity, some conditional code, but uh, smaller tensors. Okay, so um, so I'm going to move into talking about our, our CPG program now. We we have a paper out which you can it's under submission which you can read um, on archive, um, and it's a it's a fairly straightforward architecture. So it. What it does, it, it works on sequence to sequence problems. It's not a language model, so I'm not comparing comparing it to LLMs directly. Um, it's a supervised model. It works on uh, sequence tasks like translation or, or semantic parsing. Um, it takes every input, it parses it into an abstract concept hierarchy. It compositionally general, generates uh, an input specific program. So a program that is that specifically Construct it to parse that particular input and give um, to uh, to uh, to predict for that particular input, and and then it evaluates that program on the data to get your prediction. So it's dynamic in the sense that I was talking about. Um, it's abstract in a way that I'll describe, um, and it's modular because for each of the classes in this abstract class hierarchy, you have uh, an associated model module with private parameters. Um, so to to make this to give an example, um, there's this uh, sort of standard um, data set for evaluating uh, out of domain generalization called SCAN, and it's uh, instruction following. So you give it an English command in some kind of you know, simplified English, and it has to turn it into a, an ordered sequence of actions that a robot could execute. And this is like a robot on a grid, so it's we're not talking about a real robot. So for example, walk left twice means turn left, walk, turn left, walk. Or jump right thrice means turn right, jump, turn right, jump, turn right, jump. Okay, so somebody tell me what jump left twice is. I want to see who's an LLM and who's human. 180. What's that? 180. Um, no. Nope. What is it? If you see walk left twice is turn left, walk, turn left, walk. What is jump left twice? Turn left, jump, turn left, jump. Thank you. Um, okay, so you're a two-shot learner. You're not an LLM. I'm pretty sure I'm an LLM. <laughs> <laughs> How do you work? <laughs> um, okay. And if we sort of think about how, how you are able to do that. By the way, the data set has like 20,000 examples in it. Um, so... How are we able to do this? We're able to do this because, first of all, it's a systematic um, problem. We somehow, at some level, realize that jump and walk are both actions, and that either can be substituted into a little program um, to interpret what it means to do something left twice. Like you, you somehow abstract those two things. You think they're both actions, and and you automatically kind of infer some kind of program that that applies more abstractly, more generally to the data. And you can actually be very specific about what the program would look like if you write it out. Um, translate action just takes an action and uppercases it. Translate direction does almost the same thing. It just prepends a, a turn left and then an I turn in front of capital left. And you can build up the solution this way um, compositionally. So what's sort of important to remember here or to, to note is what, what kind of what we really want to get the generalization on that task is a typed program. And that's what we're trying to learn really with the CPG model. Something that does, that, that learns these functions um, to solve the problem. And I'll show you how. how it works. So um, just to point out another area where sometimes um, large language models and other neural models fail in terms of generalization is, um, in terms of length. So you, know, you never met a person who, who learns English by learning all the length seven sentences and then moving on to the length eight sentences and then the length nine sentences. We obviously learn 
general uh, abstract algebraic solutions um, at some level. And we'd like our models to do the same, but neural models tend not to do that. They tend to, to fail to generalize very far outside the training distribution. So if they only see length eight sentences, maybe they'll do length 15 sentences. It's unlikely they'll be able to handle length 55 sentences. Um, so, and this is particularly true for recursive classes. So in English, for example, noun phrases are effectively infinite length. You can generate that that's an infinite set. Um, the only way to, to really uh, correctly process noun phrases is to have a recursive solution. Okay, so here's the architecture, the CPG architecture again. It's parse uh, into an abstract hierarchy, build a computation tree, um, and evaluate. And the invariant of this model is that input expressions that are in the same class as determined by the hierarchy and the parsing are evaluate, evaluated using the same generated function. And expressions in different classes may use different functions. Um, so it really doesn't care whether two expressions are, are materially different at the token level. If they're the same at the type level, it's going to generate the same program to handle them. And that's the abstract part. That's the, that's the action class parameter. So here's, here's how it works. Um, the uh, parse is shown on the left. Um, the first step is to, um, is to um, map the uh, primitive rules. So, so the rules that map from tokens to types um, to uh, their corresponding um, uh, programs. So in this case, this dictionary program implements the translate action function on, on um, alpha and the dictionary function when applied to beta implements the translate direction function. See the outputs are shown there. And then we recursively build up this um, program. So the parse um, of the sentence would have, say, a rule delta that takes an action and a direction and gives you a directed action, I'm calling it a DA. Um, and corresponding to this rule delta is a little generated program. And that program um, is dependent just on delta. So it doesn't depend on the input directly. It never sees jump, never sees left, it never sees twice, it only sees delta. So it literally can't overfit to that data. It's abstract in the sense that it only depends on an abstract rule. Um, and so this is what the, the program it generates looks like. It does a concatenation of, the, of its inputs. It probabilistically generates a map that maps the indices from the input to the output, in this case, that mapping function, so that mapping function is learned, it's parameterized, it's a small neural network, and it's and it's got a Gumbel softmax on the top, so it, it learns to produce categorical uh, probabilistic outputs. And in this case, it's learned to swap the two arguments. So you get, I, I turn left, I jump, I turn left, I turn left, I jump on the output. Um, and you can continue this. Um, so, Really, if you look at it, what it's learning, it's learning this piece of code, translate directional action. It's it's um, taking the output of the previous step, it's mapping it in some way, and the, and in reducing um, and uh, swapping the order. And so you can continue it up up the level, up to uh, the, the twice part, in cat. In this case, it's learned a different map, and this map is maps the input indices to the output indices in a slightly different way. These two map functions again, are entirely dependent on the rules and not on the input directly. And they're learned and they're simple. So just going back to my original thought about what systematic, systematic models look like, these are you know one or two layer neural networks with a small amount of parameters. Um, and you can continue this process. Um, so that's the, um, that's the case for scan. We also tried it on a much more difficult data set, which is called COGS, which is really a semantic parsing data set. Um, in this case, this copy operation um, is, is, uh, is not the operation that you need for the modules. What you really need is this kind of substitution operation or a binding operation. So here, here the, um, the, instead of having sequences, we have pairs of expressions with variables and objects. 
and it learns to substitute objects into the variables in the expression and builds up the solution composition. Um, so I won't go into that in more detail, but there is another example in the paper. Um, so we, we did some experiments. Um, we took the scan and COGS data sets, and you can see how big they are here. Um, and we reduced them a lot because we wanted to test Fuchsia. So for scan, we reduced it from about 17,000 down to 14 examples. For COGS, from 24,000 down to 22 examples. It's about a 1,000 X reduction in the size of the data sets. And the way we did this was there's different things you can imagine doing. What we did is we sorted the input, sorted um, the data set by the input length, so by the sentence length that you're trying to uh, to uh, to translate into instructions or logic. Um, and we went through and we parsed it. We just used an off the shelf parser. We had we we used the grammar, so we we are not learning the grammar. Just to be clear, we used a, a an off the shelf grammar for these two data sets. And we, um, we we looped through and removed any instances which didn't have new types. So we only kept the instances if the parses introduced a type that hadn't been seen in a previous instance. It was actually, yeah. Uh, just a clarification. I mean, if this is truly compositional in the way you're wanted to be, it should be immaterial whether there are superfluous cases. So why not just be the 14,000? So lack of computers or I mean, you've done a lot of work to shrink it down, but why would the extra 999? Oh, they wouldn't, they wouldn't. The point is just to prove that it could work on a smaller number because- Did you try it on the whole- Sure. It was, it, it oh yeah, yeah, it works on the it works on more. Okay. Yeah, it's not, I mean, it's a good question, but no, yeah, we, we did try it. Um, and, and there's different things you could do. You could also just keep keep instances if they have new parses rather than new types. That's a little bit kinder. So you get more data that way, but it works the same. So we, we just took, went with the one that reduced it the most. Um, so then, and, and here they are. This is the, those, the, these are the instances for that data set. Um, they can, they can, you can fit both data sets on one page now. Um, and each, so each instance here, in a sense, is an exemplar that introduces new types that are important for it to learn. If you didn't have one of these sentences, it might encounter a new type during test time, and it wouldn't know what to do with it. You need to cover all the types in some way in the data. These cover all the types. Um, so I, I mentioned before it, um, that, that we're using small small networks for these modules. Um, the, mod, the model is end-to-end -end differentiable. We use standard SGT training. Um, it's curricular because we, we process the sentences in, in length order, which is important. Um, the uh, the parameters it learns are for the modules, um, and and the base the sort of base dictionary, the special module that maps the, the lowest level. Um, very small networks, no embeddings. It's, it really acts more like a, a transducer in the computer in the computer science sense, taking a sequence of symbols and turning it into another sequence sequence of symbols. Um, the training time is com comparable to neural networks on, on even on the smaller amount of data because. We, we currently didn't scale it. So it's not GPU. These, the modules are, are a little bit hard to formulate in a tensor fashion. We didn't try, we ultimately just went with a loop and, it, and it, the batch size is one. But even still, it's, it's a bit faster than neural networks. Um, and there's more details on this and the code is, is available if you want to try it. Go ahead. <laughs> Was this all noise free? And so, did you try it with some noise? It is noise free. Um, we didn't try it with noise yet, so it is fair point <laughs> limitation. Um, I I have a thought on that, which I'll mention at the end. So then we have five minutes. Okay, perfect. Um, so here are some results. Um, we we compared against a lot of different benchmark models. Um. In particular, um, tuned up transformers. Um, it turned out that on that COGS data set, when they first tested it on transformers, they were not sufficiently uh, industrious in in trying to get it to work. And Schmidt Huber and Sordas um, put put out uh, a transformer parameters and and uh, hyperparameters that made it work much better than the original paper reported. So these are the the better numbers I'm showing here. Um, there are, we tried three different neurosymbolic 
approaches. So there's this, there's something called Lane, Lear, and MPS. And probably the, the most interesting or the one that was most challenging in a way was a, a recent paper that, that tried to solve these problems using, um, using prompting and, and uh, large language models. So they, they had a, a version of, of chain of thought prompting called least to most prompting. Um, and they actually used it to like teach it the grammar and teach it. So in some ways they did very similar things to what we did. We gave it the grammar, they gave it a bunch of examples that required that you know the grammar in order to construct them in the first place, got it to work and then got it to do the task. Um, and to net it out, we, we got state-of-the-art accuracy with just the 14 or 22 examples. Um, Transformers used a lot of data and just did horribly. Um, the neural symbolic approaches were pretty good. Um, they were better than the transformers, but they still used a lot of data. So they, they still weren't few shot. Um, and we ended up out, we, we outperformed the LLM approach on accuracy as well as on, on sample efficiency. Um, I should, I should say that I don't know that they tried to optimize for sample efficiency. So it's a little bit, I, I shouldn't really take it as a criticism. Um, they used 100 examples. We got it down to 22 examples, but they may be able to do better if, they, if that was something that they care about. Um, so uh, another thing um, that's kind of cool about this is that you can, you know, I, I mentioned that we train in a curricular way. So you, we train um, in this sequence and it learns new types as new instances are introduced. Um, we, once we've learned the old instances, we just freeze these maps, these functions that it's learned, and we just reuse them to help it learn the new instances. So we get back to that, what I was saying, it's actually using compositionality while it's learning to learn faster. And you can see that. So the top the top graph is the, um, I guess the training set, is the uh, test set curves. And, and they're, you know, they're very nice and non, non high variance. So they shift a little bit, basically they all have the same shape. These are five runs, um, but the, but the, the key thing is the bottom curve shows you the training curves for these things. And you'll notice the, the dashed lines where we, we hit a, a new curriculum, a new uh, stage of the curriculum and we introduce new types. And that's where you'd expect the accuracy to drop because now you've got things that it knows nothing about. Um, but in fact, it doesn't drop to zero. And the reason is because it's using the types it's using the functions that it's learned earlier in earlier iterations, and in some cases, zero shot generalizing to solve longer sentences with no additional training, even in the beginning of the iteration. And actually that gets better over time. So as you get into further iterations, it has more knowledge and it, and it drops even less as you move into new. Of course, that's task dependent, but this is for this task, this is what we saw. Um, so you, you are getting incremental, non-forgetting, um, uh, efficient learning. Um, okay, so limitations. Um, it needs a context-free grammar. Um, we're learning, we're working on a, I'll tell you one thing that's sort of interesting is that um, when we were debugging it, we often found that the module, we could, we could identify modules that were performing badly. We can trace the module to particular grammar rules that they're associated with. And that allowed us to sort of find places in the grammar where we might have a problem that was causing it to learn badly. For example, if you have sort of repeated types, if instead, of, instead of making a new class and using that class everywhere in the grammar, if you just use the right-hand side of the rule, the left-hand side of the rule and not, and not introduce a new type, then you're having essentially to learn that new rule in multiple contexts and that can slow it down. Um, but so we had one of those, we refactored it, we created a new type, we used that new type consistently throughout and, it's, and it solves the problem. And we had a few things like that. So there's, it makes me think that there's a meta learning algorithm here that would be interesting to explore where we train it, we trace from the modules back to the grammar, from the modules that are not perfect, we trace back to the grammar to the rules that they are associated with and the types, and we make adjust small, small local adjustments to the grammar to try to make it better. And then we go back and train it again in a kind of meta learning loop. So that's sort of on our agenda. Um, in terms of the, the noise, which is a, a great point, um, this is a place where I think LLMs can, can come in because I think we can use an LLM 
to translate noisy, idiomatic sentences into simplified English sentences. Maybe we go all the way to logic or something else, or some more, more formal thing, but we should be able to go, uh, done a, we've done a little bit of experimentation from you know very idiomatic English to kind of straightforward English from which you could maybe learn or provide the grammar. So to me, LLMs have, you know, they have an amazing grammatical ability. They have, they're extremely fluent. We could use them for that and, and, and use them to attack the brittleness problem of, of having to learn a grammar like, like the one I showed, but for really complicated sentences in English. So that's sort of the line of attack. Um, and as I mentioned, we, you know, we use, uh, we don't really take, we don't use GPUs right now. So, so figuring out how to scale it. On the other hand, if you don't use that much data, maybe you don't need to scale it that much, you know, if we can, or we need to scale it in a different way. Um, so limitations. So uh, finally, um, just to sort of sum it up, uh, LLMs are not systematic in several ways. They don't recognize and respect important abstractions in the problem consistently. Similar things treated differently, different things are treated similarly, and composition is patchy and poor. So maybe it'll get better with more scaling. Depends if you're half glass half full or I'm a glass quarter full guy. Um, systematic models can do much better. They require, at least in this very limited setting, they require several orders of magnitude less data. Um, they solve these benchmarks that test out of domain generalization and uh, that's it. Thank you. Time for one, one short question. One short question. Yeah. Um, so scan seems almost uh, absurdly contrived to be mean about it, right? Um, so yeah. What domain, um, so one domain that springs to mind is uh, program generation. Yes. Right? These are codecs. So what are the prospects for taking this and building up Compositional program libraries, which are actually useful for, you know, you know, in in the wild uh, code generation. Where, where can you show this uh, is actually scalable so that people want? Yeah. Um. Right. So that's one example. I think the most immediately compelling example is in semantic parsing. Although we didn't really uh, didn't go into it very heavily, but um, the COGS data set is actually quite a bit more complicated. It has sixty different types. I didn't go into it because it's too. I tried to look at them. For uh, okay. yeah. um, and so it, it's a bit more of a test, um, but I think... Um, so parsing to AMR or something like that? Or, sorry? Parsing to AMR or something? So exactly, parsing to AMR or just some version of FOL or whatever you're more... So I, yeah, I think that that's the one. What I'd like to be able to get to is, can we turn? Can we take some of these ideas and get transferred to building a, a language model or something that is... that that is more efficient to train, or um, can we get, can we use this to solve few shot intelligence tests, things like, you know, IQ tests or the ARC data set, um, few shot, few shot reasoning, few shot systematic problems is where I think it, it has potential. So just a small um, follow-up question. Like, yeah. um, how about open vocabulary? You talked about uh, like, um, noise, but I mean, can you cover open vocabulary if you have in mind like LLM, something like that? So how do you do that? Um, it can't currently, currently we use tokens from some fixed vocabulary. So just like, but I think who, who what, what machine learning algorithms, models can really handle open vocabulary because they can't, if they haven't seen it in training, they. I mean, there are a few matching networks and things like that, but it's not really common. It's, it's too big, or too big of words, like token dictionary. Could it handle a larger? Yeah, um, yeah I don't think that. It, I mean, I'm trying to think what the scaling is with respect to the vocabulary size. Um, it, it, we'd have to try it. I, I'm not sure. I, I don't. It it seems so much more efficient. I mean, it's so much more just qualitatively pleasant to, to train it that I feel like it would be it would be something that we could do. We'd have to try it. Sure. Just a quick follow up. There, there are some very big lexical uh, knowledge sources about language, like English resource grammar. Yeah. So if you kind of threw that into the LLM. Basically, would be the type system 
almost Yeah, in fact, we looked at, well, you probably know, but we, yeah, we, we've looked at ERG um, as, a, as a, something that we'd like to try here to see if we can do. That's definitely on our to-do list. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you.